So I invite the Dr. JP to come and. Anyway, there's something more interesting going outside. So. Oh, the tea break is. And I don't know why they said Subhash tea ban karne ka. Ban kar diya. Okay. One of the most important aspects of epidemiology and research methodology is how does one go about drawing causal conclusion. Um, and uh, how do we know A cause B? In examining that issue, I would like to point out that we human beings have a sort of general tendency to jump into causal conclusion. You know, if my son walks into the kitchen and there's a loud noise, immediately my wife will say, Naveen, what did you break now? Okay, she doesn't have to see you know, that the connection. If two things are together in time and space, human mind ascribes causality. This story I am going to tell you is one that my professor used to taught me and I loved it. It brings in the point very nicely. You know, during the Second World War, the one phase of the war called the Battle of Britain, when the German Air Force was bombing the city of London. One night the bombing was particularly heavy and a huge building collapsed. And the rescue workers went through the rubble and found a man trapped in a toilet. He was unhurt but quite shaken. So they pulled him out and asked him, are you okay? The guy said, I guess so, but you wouldn't believe what happened. I just pulled the flush and the whole building collapsed. <laughs> now, that is human mind, you know. You connect things causally. And doctors are famous for doing that. Once they prescribe something, something goes wrong. Never again. That is bad medicine. Every physician acquires a series of these belief patterns. Causality, we call it. And we are full of it. Now, it's quite difficult sometimes to overcome this kind of a causal fixations. For example, South America, they had the sun god and they used to worship sun god. You know how they did it? Every moment, morning, before the dawn, they'll cut open a human chest, take beating heart and face the east and pray to sun god. The sun will rise and say, Firming the faith in their ritual. And they were very scared not to do it. Why? If the sun didn't come, life will cease to exist. So for decades and decades, they sacrificed human beings. Just so that the sun would come off. So in this sort of framework of human weakness and frailty, and we have to ask, how do we scientifically, in an unbiased manner, ascribe causality? A bit, a little bit of history will help. You know, the, how do we acquire knowledge? The concept had two basic origins. And it's important for you to know that. One group, and I will say the, the leader of that is Plato. He said, all knowledge comes from within. What do you mean? Well, human beings are born with all knowledge. All you do is sit and meditate, think, and out comes the knowledge. You don't have to come for research methodology. You just find a good tree, sit under it and meditate, all the chi squares will appear. Okay? That is one way. That group of people, 
of thinking is called rationalism. Have you heard that? Rationalism. These words. Rationalism. Is um, Aristotle was a little different thinking person. He said, you don't get knowledge that way. You acquire knowledge through observation, studying, collecting information. And, <clears throat> and that viewpoint is called knowledge through empiricism. Empiricism as a method of gathering information. Easy way to remember these two groups. They like spiders. Spinning webs. What about this? Collecting, collecting data, you know, and storing. From the stored information, knowledge comes. The moment I say this, I'm sure you'll realize the true knowledge must be a combination of these two. Like in the case of a honeybee. Collect nectar and from there you produce the honey. So these two things I had to mention because the two types of logic that you and I use coming to conclusion. From rationalism comes a type of logic called deductive logic. From empiricism, the type of logic called inductive logic. And science go through the process of moving from inductive logic to deductive logic. And you should be conscious of which way you are proceeding. What is deductive logic? deduce. That's what Sherlock Holmes used to use it. What he does is, they take some axioms and if those axioms are true, then your conclusion must be true. That is the fundamental aspect of a deductive logic. I once went into a hall to give a talk. There were 400 people sitting there. And I said, at least two in this room must have the same birthday. You know what a birthday is. October 2nd is Gandhi Jayanti and so on. Now the question to you is, could I go wrong? Could I be wrong? What did I say? At least two in this room must have the same birthday. Could I be wrong? She said, no way. Possible? I could be wrong? No way. There are only three sixty five days. I had to be right. Because I used two axioms. One, there are four hundred people sitting in the room. Second axiom, there are only three sixty six days in a year. So if these two axioms are correct, my conclusion must be right. And in medicine, we use this deductive logic all the time, deducing from data how do we, I mean, how not, how. Let me give a simple example. We had a group of children. Is my mic going on and on? Or is just my ear has gone wrong?
I know this is not an ophthalmology solution, but I followed up a group of newborn babies till they were my objective was to see how many of them will develop hip pneumonia or hip meningitis. So these 3,000 children we followed up till they were 3 years old. And you know what we found? A few developed pneumonia, one or two developed meningitis. All this de development of meningitis and pneumonia occurred below the age of two. After two, no pneumonia, no meningitis. Alright, I have given you my study findings. So what do you conclude from this? Told you a few develop pneumonia, who develop meningitis, but majority didn't develop the disease. But all occurred below the age of two years. This is the kind of Now question to you is, why aren't children developing disease after two years? Hmm? Resistance is higher. Why do they become resistant after two years? After the second birthday, they get a resistance gift. Hmm? something funny, no? Antibodies. Antibodies, you have to be exposed to the organism. I told you, you develop the disease. So what do you say? Hmm? How did they, huh? pardon? Right. The others must have got the infection I didn't see that, but I deduce it. You understand? The deductive logic works like that. You don't see everything, but you say, it must be so. That's why nobody after two is developing the disease. So, this is a series, beginning of a series of thinking that we use in medicine come to newer and newer research avenue. For example, the next question we ask is, hey, if everybody is developing pneumonia, uh, hip infection, how come children are getting infected? Who is giving the infection? So somebody says, maybe the older children are carrying it in their nose. So we took for carriage. Yes, there was. He said, hey, what is this? These fellows are developing immunity, but still carrying. And that's where we realize Invasiveness is one thing, carriage is another one. So what happens is you have a series of journey, hypothesis, deduction, new induction, and this is the way we progress in science. So these two aspects of research are very interrelated. Very often what happens is we design clinical trials and don't look at the question from a bigger sense. And I want to emphasize that as you come to it. But slightly take a, take a detour. Long ago, you know, who knew answer to all the problems? In the West, church knew the answers to all problems. You have a doubt, you go to the priest and ask him. He'll tell you everything about science. And one particular cardinal, his name was Cardinal Fracastorio, one morning got up and said, I know how diseases are caused. They said, how? 
They are caused by small animals which cannot be seen with the naked eye. Okay, and the theory was called theory of contagion vivum. Small animals which can't be seen with the naked eye. So there are other people who don't go to church that regularly. They trust the church to come out with ghost stories. Okay, small animals can't be seen. No way. They put a counter argument. No, no, diseases are caused by bad environment. And that is the theory called theory of miasma. Miasma. Contagion vivum, miasma. These two were a completely polarized group. AI, DMK and DMK. They won't talk to each other. A miasma guy won't give his daughter in marriage to the contagion vivum guy. Eventually you know what happened. Luan Hook was able to bring a little microscope and Louis Pasteur could conclusively show all many diseases are caused by small animals you can't see with the naked eye. Contagion Vivum 1. And that was the era of bacteriology. Those days, everybody wanted to do bacteriology. If you ask somebody, what's your son doing? They say, bacteriology. Now they say software, no? That day it was bacteriology. And people were discovering bugs all over the place. You know, fever germ, headache germ, backache germ, you name it, there are germ, germs all around. And that's one. this guy called Henley and his student, Robert Koch, they came out with some rules. Do you remember Cox postulate? Vaguely, right? For a small chocolate, who can tell me Cox postulate? Okay, medium-sized chocolate. Hmm? Does anybody remember? Well, there are three postulates. I'll tell you what they are. Number one, the suspected bug agent, bug or agent, must be present in every case of the disease. So if you say disease D is caused by bacterium B, B should be present in every case of D. The second postulate is the agent must not be present in the absence of the disease. Okay, if the guy is hanging around everywhere, then you can't call him, accuse him of causing the disease. And the third one is a cruel one. This is the one most people remember. What? You should be able to isolate the bug, take it out, put it on somebody else and make him suffer. Then that is the real proof. The first two are called observational criteria for causation. The third one is called experimental criteria for causation. Let us focus on the first two. Observational criteria for causation. You know, epidemiologists have a habit Everything we put in a 2 by 2 cell, you know, and that makes it very easy to think things through. So I look at these two postulates into a 2 by 2 cell. Agent or the organism present, absent. Disease present, absent. Okay, according to the first postulate, must be present. Look at this. According to the first postulate, C should be zero. Do you follow that? Person has disease, they should have agent. No question of absence of it. C equal to zero. Similarly, if B is zero.
Huh? <laughs> you know, the postulate that Robert Koch made came into this very stringent criteria for causality. A cause to be registered as a cause, it should be both a necessary cause and a sufficient cause. Otherwise, it is not a causal agent. Now, things would have been very quiet had it did not been for the cigarette controversy. Okay. Bradford and Hill carried out this large study out of which came the suspicion that maybe cigarette smoking is associated with the risk of lung cancer. That study, yesterday somebody actually showed the... Uh, uh, reference to the study. If you read the study, you should remember the authors were very apologetic. Okay, they said we may think it is important. Lung cancer is caused by this. Now the difficulty was smoking was part of the social structure. You know, school children were given tobacco to smoke for the lungs will be small. And we know instances where they were cane for not smoking. That was the culture in Britain those days. And come the study. And of all the um, by statisticians we know, Fisher was probably the biggest figure. And Fisher came out strongly against and said, no way you can call an association as a causal association. Okay? Now, the, there are two things that worries me about it. Number one was, Fisher himself was a smoker. That's okay. But then most Britons were smokers then. But the cigarette company, when we, they saw trouble coming from this corner, quickly appointed Fisher as their advisor. Okay? With a handsome sum of money. Naturally, Fisher supported the company. So it took a long time. After uh, the first paper came in 54, after a long time, it didn't make any impact. But one thing that became very clear was, this model for causality doesn't work. Because they asked the question, is every lung cancer patient a smoker? No. Does every smoker get lung cancer? No. There. We rest our case. That is the thing. And Bradford Hill had to think afresh and say, how do we look at causality afresh? A new method. <clears throat> what I showed you just now is what is called as a very deterministic model. Agent present, disease present. Agent absent, disease absent. Somewhere around 1920, the most deterministic of all our sciences, the physics, gave up determinism. See, physics was very deterministic. One degree increase in temperature will increase the volume by so many cc. Everything was perfect. In 1920, physics was overrun by quantum mechanics, quantum physics. There nothing is fixed. Everything is probabilistic. So epidemiology had to move away from this deterministic model into a more probabilistic model. And have a view that now we don't say smoking causes lung cancer in the same sense that we used to say. What we say is, smoking increases the probability of lung cancer. Okay? The chance game comes in. So Bradford Hill came out with certain important rules, and I'm going to list them and discuss briefly, because it has to influence each of your writing articles, how you argue your case out. But before that, I want to introduce a guy called David Hume. Anybody heard the name David Hume? 
from a British point of view or a Western point of view, he was a most influential philosopher. David Hume came out with the argument saying that, listen, by observing, you can't prove anything. What do you say? Let us say you have a switch here, you put it on, light comes on. Put it off, the light goes off. After 30 experiments, can you now say the switch is connected with the light? He says, how do you know there is another nut sitting in the other room, fiddling around with a different switch? Okay, how sure are you? Take the case of two clocks. One is one second behind the other. This one starts ringing 12. One second later, this fellow starts ringing 12. Will you say this clock caused this to hit? So 1A follows B. That means B caused A. That doesn't work. That was his argument. Little more than that. It's a little too complicated. But let me simplify it. He said, take a lighted matchstick. Bring it close to your finger. You can see the lighted matchstick. You can even feel the pain. But the fact that the pain was caused by the lighted matchstick, you are making up in your mind. There is no logical content in the argument. A caused B. It's like a pulling the flush. And this to happen and that followed. How do you study causality if this is the problem? So David Hume really spanned the whole thinking process. Till another gentleman, his name is Popper, Karl Popper. Uh, in the in in last century, he was the most influential thinker in science. He said, David Hume is correct. You can't prove anything, but you can disprove. How does that work? I say that switch has nothing to do with the light. That is my hypothesis. I put the light on, switch, light comes on. I put it off, it goes off. After 30 experiments, what do I say? Oh, oh, I don't have enough evidence to support my hypothesis. Which was, the switch has nothing to do with the light. I reject that hypothesis in favor of what? Naturally, the opposite is, the switch has something to do with the light. Now that has a logical basis. You start with the hypothesis, smoking has nothing to do with lung cancer. And you gather data. At the end of it, you say, oh no, this data doesn't support my hypothesis. So I have to reject my hypothesis in favor of the opposite. That is, smoking has something to do with lung cancer. Believe me, it's our science works that way through a series of hypotheses which we try to refute, falsify. And our research base is rather tenuous if you ask me. But that is the way we work. Okay? And that is why in statistics we always have to come out with a null hypothesis and reject because the opposite is not logically feasible. Anyway, so now we have a framework for thinking causally. And Bradford came out with the first statement, asked the question, how strong is the association? Strength of association. Now, I want to tell you a story which happened in Velo. We were looking at third degree malnutrition rate in our villages. And the rate of third degree malnutrition we found was 6%. That is bad. 6% of our children are under 5 are malnourished to third degree. So we said we have to have a program. We had a massive program of nutrition education program for all the mothers. How to feed the baby the right food. Two and a half years later, we measured the rate of malnutrition. You know what we found? It had come to 
down to 4%. That was very accelerating because our effort has produced a good result. But then one painful joker in our department, he started digging up some old data. He showed that three years ago it was 8% and another three years ago it was 10%. Now what does it look like? Hmm? Ah, it was anyway coming down. We got lucky to start a program when we started. The moral of the story is you start a program, you should know when to start. It is not our, obviously something was happening there anyway. But tell me, we made a blunder. How could we have avoided the blunder? Ah, had we put a comparison group and not give an education there and watch there also if there was a fall, then we would have known it is not our intervention, something else. Like In other words, he just spoke of a great truth. In epidemiology, you cannot talk of association unless there is a comparison group. No comparison group, no epidemiology, no association. There's no question. Anything you want to ask about in epidemiology, it has to have a basis of a comparison group. In fact, my, one of my good students, he went home after the course, somebody asked him, Hey man, how is your wife? He said, as compared to what? Now, that is a good epidemiology student. Okay? <laughs> so, <clears throat> so, from this emerges the basic question of strength of association. And we measure it using something called a relative risk, which you have heard of. Relative risk. What is the equation for relative risk? Incidence among exposed divided by incidence among unexposed. Incidence of lung cancer among smokers divided by incidence of lung cancer among non-smokers. And you know what the relative risk is for smoking and lung cancer? 15. That huge. 15 times more likely to develop lung cancer if you're a smoker as compared to a non-smoker. Now, Relative risk has a range of 0 to 1 and 1 to infinitum. And this side is risk and below 1 is protection. As you are away from 1, the strength of association increases. Whether you go up or down, the further you are away from 1, the stronger and stronger association. All right. So this is what we go by. First ask the question, how strong is the association? Okay. The second question we ask is, is there a dose response? The cigarette company said, listen, smoking actually doesn't cause lung cancer. What happens is some people have very sensitive hyperimmune lung. So they take a puff, they cough and sneeze and they can't smoke. But their lung also is very hyperimmune so they don't allow malignancy to set in. Okay, their natural killer cells work better. But there are others with lungs which are more hardy. They can tolerate smoke. They also unfortunately have high risk of lung cancer. So smoking doesn't cause lung cancer. It screens people who can develop lung cancer and who won't develop lung cancer. Don't blame smoking for lung cancer. Bradford Hill's answer was dose response. He showed how those who smoke 1 to 10 had this much relative risk. Those who smoke 11 to 20, more, more, and we have. A dose response is one of the most convincing way you clinch causality. You know, even now, there are a lot of people who don't believe 
cholesterol causes heart disease. Okay, they really there are it's an anti lipid group mainly because you know the typical American breakfast is full of fat. You know, so they said this is a attack against our culture. Okay, so bacon and eggs and you know what not. That is the way to go. The stories you won't believe. But if you heard of a condition called familial hypercholesterolemia, have you heard of it? You would acquire the gene. If you are homozygous, usually your cholesterol is above 800 milligram. And how long do you live? You don't see your 20th birthday. And what do you die of? Ischemic heart disease. But if you are only hetero, heterozygous, eh? and you've got a half, then your cholesterol is closer to 600. And what happens to you? You don't see your 40th birthday. And what do you die of? Coronary heart disease. Now, when you see this kind of a dose response, it is very convincing that this suspected risk factor is a causal factor. So whenever you do the analysis, of your data, the first thing you do is, can you show a dose response? Whichever way your exposure factor and outcome. Which clinches causality. Let me show you one more picture. This is my data from the law on perinatal mortality. Do you know what perinatal mortality is? These are children dying. What kind of death? Either stillbirth or early neonatal death. Okay, early neonate means first week of life. And this is the data for three groups of women. 60 per thousand, 40 per thousand and 20 per thousand. What are these three groups? These are women who had A and C, three or less number of antenatal checkup. These are for women four to five, and these are for women six or more. With increasing amount of antenatal checkup, you have lower and lower perinatal mortality rate. Now, look at that. Would you agree with me that one way to reduce perinatal mortality is to have proper antenatal checkup, adequate number? It looks like that, right? But be careful. This is where you need to be wiser. A woman normally comes for the first checkup at 16 weeks. And a second checkup around 22 weeks. And maybe a third checkup at 28 weeks. Then she has a stillbirth. Will he come back for a checkup? Most of the case of early neonatal death is because of premature baby. They are born early. Now the problem comes up. Is antenatal checkup reducing perinatal mortality rate? Or is perinatal mortality reducing antenatal checkup? You follow? If there's an early neonatal loss, why would they come back for antenatal checkup? Now, this is the most difficult problem in research methodology sorting out what is called temporal ambiguity. So, the third thing that I asked was there should be no temporal ambiguity. What this means is the cause should precede the effect. Um, there are some early studies on what is the drug you use to reduce um, acid secretion? Hmm? Rantag. Ranitidine, when he first came to market, it was a big hit. What happened? For the first time, you could get rid of 
aseptic disease in no time, miracle. And then came one study which was very disturbing, which found an association between stomach cancer and ranitidine. What happened? They did a study and showed that most people who had lung, stomach cancer had an exposure to ranitidine earlier. The problem was, before accusing ranitidine, you ask the question, why were the people with stomach cancer taking ranitidine? That is because they had a funny feeling in the stomach. So ranitidine must have come after the onset of the disease. So that is what I mean by temporal ambiguity. And tough one, mind you, in all our research to look at. The fourth thing, these three points, in every research paper, you should be able to bring out concretely. This is what your study will show. Then you will have your literature review. To look at consistency of evidence. But the other studies are consistent with what you are seeing. And if everybody shows the same pattern, then you would say, yeah, there seems to be something happening. The same one study in UK, one in US, one in China, one in India, all of them show the same pattern. One is tempted to say, there must be a causal mechanism underlying this. In your discussion, what you should focus on, this biological possibility. Biological possibility. You know, one of my friends went to Japan. She learned acupuncture and came back. So she now comes back with a whole lot of long, short, broad needles. If you have a headache on your right temple, she'll take a needle and put it on your left big toe. And after some time, the headache is supposed to go. Now look at the evidence. Is there a strong association? Yeah, there appears to be, you know. With the needle, asthma gets better, the headache goes off. Is there a dose response? I don't know. Anybody who has good at acupuncture, more needle, quick, quicker relief? I don't know. Temporal ambiguity. No temporal ambiguity. After the needle goes in only the headache disappears. Consistency of evidence. They do it in China, Vietnam, Bhutan, wherever you go. They have the needle. They are doing successful. Biological process. How the heck do you explain it? You and I are practitioners of what is called modern medicine. We have no way of explaining it. So I am not putting down acupuncture. I am trying to explain the meaning, biological plausibility. There was a study some time back where if husband smokes, the risk of wife developing CA cervix, relative risk is 3. Now wait a minute, that is a damn difficult thing to explain biologically, okay? So biological possibility is actually the key to your argument. If it doesn't satisfy this test, all this I am going to ignore. Because there should be a sensible explanation why smoking could conceivably cause lung cancer. <coughs> That is the hardest part to evolve. And <clears throat> now there are two other factors and they are much more important. Please remember, causality is a very personal issue. If you read articles now, sometimes they say, hey, coffee drinking is bad for you. One week later there will be article, coffee drinking is good for you. Okay. Now, if you are very meticulous, you are, sometimes you are drinking coffee, sometimes you are drinking tea, sometimes you are drinking nothing. Who do you follow? Bulk of the literature on chronic disease is humbug. Okay, I believe me. And um, the problem 
comes up this way. Do you know, have you heard of Thanksgiving? Thanksgiving yeah. service? In the US. US. What they do is, they cut a turkey, every family, yeah. okay? And they make a turkey roast with pumpkin pie and cranberry sauce. And they have this grand thing. And you ask them, why did you do Why do you do that? Oh, our forefathers, when they came the first time in New England, after the first year, this is what they did. They had turkey and pumpkin pie rubbish. Nothing of that so happened. This was a story created by Turkey Farmers Association. Okay. <laughs> now Barack Obama has broken huh? it. Barack Obama has broken it by saying, save a turkey during the Thanksgiving. <laughs> it's done on Christmas also. Actually, the Pilgrim Fathers ate venison. There's a lot of deer there and that's what they ate, no turkey. <laughs> but with that, what happens is every year, turkey farmers sell during the Thanksgiving more than 50 million turkeys. That's a huge amount of money. And many research is like this. Cranberry juice is good for you. Beetroot juice is good for you. So, whole lot of things. Now, the justification for that comes from biological that is what will guard you against. Half the advertisements in Indian um, TV is rubbish, okay? Because they create it on their own because there is no problem in India. You can say anything and get away with it. But how do you challenge that, sir? Even in US, this bilberry yeah. is useful for ARMD, they say. And I don't know what's the study. And similar, now in the uh, Asia Pacific region, Dennis Lam is a well known ophthalmologist who is now doing a claiming to do a scientific study on acupuncture in, what do you call that, uh, lazy eye, the amblyopia. And how do we prove the causality? Now, how do you contradict them? This is a very powerful tool. Okay. The evidence, of course, we had to look at the evidence. But more importantly, this part. Now, remember, the main difference between medicine and physics. Physics has theory. Medicine has no theory. We know interleukin 12 will go up, interleukin 8 will come up. What does it, what does it mean underlying? We don't know. Who is the one who said, medicine is not an exact science? Well, the word you have to remove is si exact. Medicine is hardly a science, okay? <laughs> a lot of belief pattern. So, the probably in the whole of biological uh, sign. The most useful or scientific work was by Charles Darwin. And what is the basis I say this is the most important is because it explains huge number of variables on a fewest number of assumptions. Okay, when you need a model it's got a lot and lot of variables. And science now, we have a very complex situation. We won't go into that. I want to stop here and ask you this question. Do you have any question? So I had a question. Like or come, uh, remarks. How to contradict uh, these people who claim that you do some uh, yoga and uh, you, know, uh, you can remove the glass number and then uh, you know, use Ayurvedic and don't go to the retina specialist for a laser in retinopathy. And we are not able to take any action. I think mean, scientifically we know they are wrong, but we don't know how to prove that. The other point is, there is in any treatment you give to a patient, hmm. whether you give placebo treatment or real treatment, okay. there is some effect noticed, even huh? in patients who are taking yeah, placebo. Which is, uh, even in patients who are on placebo treatment, you do notice a significant difference in symptoms, significant alteration in symptoms, etc. <laughs> Causality. <laughs> you did something. A microphone, microphone. A mic change, Corona. The the effect of placebo may be actually true, although it is placebo. But we have to be able to differentiate between these two. 
how do we these two effects so how do we go about in uh, literature in, in in research i tell you um, in general an honest research should be able to i don't know whether you know the story of angina pectoris yes <laughs> you know the story i don't remember but uh, I... <laughs> angina pectoris is a classical one but I explain you somebody said uh, so if you have angina pectoris all you do is you go inside the chest identify the internal mammary artery and cut it angina will disappear i'm talking about days before we had all the yes sir uh, angio and thing like and this study became a popular surgery and many people including mayo clinic published a series of angina surgery for which cure rates were pretty good 80% and people say listen we need to have a proper randomized control trial and finally nih gave a remember a lot of ethical problems said how can you do a randomized trial for a study with mayo clinic has produce 80% cure rate you are playing with people's life this finally they did the study all subjects who had angina pectoris as assessed by a cardiologist were admitted to a hospital everybody they got a proper informed consent this is important proper on the day of the surgery everybody was prepared and sent to the theater and everybody was given anesthesia and everybody opened the as a chest was open and internal mammary identified at that point they said let us have the randomization cover they open if it's a cut it off they cut it off otherwise you left it like that and closed and came back a perfect randomized control trial the thoracic surgeon was not involved in the trial the cardiologist didn't know what happened inside the results came out people who just had internal mammary isolation the cure rate them among them was 37% okay nothing was touched sorry all oh, those who had a surgery i 37% improved what about the other group which are only isolation 44% improved this surgery was never repeated after that okay so the answer to your question is very simple encourage engage and do randomized trials with the support of the people we'll get the answers any other comments how can we expect does it pure placebo if, um, placebo effect in different groups or real something going on which you, we have no idea what how will you put it <clears throat> i'll tell you one thing a bit of history will help you do you know what our system of medicine is called allopathy allopathy do you know the origin of the word allopathy allopathy started with a guy called hanuman who created homeopathy he said his system of medicine is holistic homeopathy and the rest rubbish called allopathy <laughs> so we should never use the word allopathy for to ourselves that is a degradatory term discovered by the originator of homeopathy okay we call ourselves modern medicine yeah. okay modern. now why did homeopathy succeed the reason was a lot of problem with the so called allopathy those days blood letting whole lot of things were dangerous so as a consequence this homeopathy which is essentially a placebo treatment thrive because human body cures most illnesses okay so you make advantage of it so the answer to this is there is a placebo effect there's no doubt about it but if you have an alternative that is better then you can prove the alternative is better in other words in areas where modern medicine doesn't have a proper remedy then these things seem to survive
That's right. Placebo. Have you heard of a thing, something called nocebo? That is the opposite of placebo. Placebo is a good effect following um, a treatment. I, I remember there's once a child aged five and a half was brought to me in status asthmaticus. The child came from far away. They went to several doctors. Finally, I was the one who looked after them. I was scared that I might lose the child. I had to put him on steroids, everything. These are the days when we didn't have nebulization, nothing. Child was fent cured. Now, for one year, I didn't see the mother and the child because she came far away. One year later, she came back with the son. She held my hand and thanked me profusely. What is the point? The child, after I treated the child, it never had the asthma again. Okay, why? Well, this happens again and again. At around five years, children with asthma cease having asthma. It was just a coincidence, I happened to treat them. But the sad part was, she had collected six other mothers and their children and brought all the way, saying this one doctor who can cure it. <laughs> I mean, question in the sense that all I am saying is I trained a lot of non-MBBS medical graduates in epidemiology. They are Ayurvedic. The, all the message I was is I'll give you research methodology for heaven's sake. Ev show evidence to us that your system works. Okay, we haven't done that properly in India yet. I mean, I am not saying one is inferior or anything. If there is a good thing, we should be able to bring it out. If yoga brings out something, the problem is not in an effort to do uh, it. One of the bad things about science is you should never do science to show something. You should do science to see. Don't sh try to do yoga to sh uh, science, try to show yoga helps to reduce blood pressure. Do the stand see if whether yoga does bring down blood pressure. You should be unbiased. Let us chase truth, not pet ideas. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. JP. I think always, uh, as always, interesting session.